Issues. This is Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan and Rockefeller Center in Newsstand Studios, joined as usual with uh, Gene. How you doing? Doing great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I called you Gene because I just said Gene to my Siri. Excellent. Siri doesn't know that Gene's name is John, so when I'm walking to oh. this place and I'm like huffing and puffing because I ride a bike here, I say, text Gene Nahowl, which is not his name. And so then for about five minutes, John's name is still Gene in my head. I'm sorry, John. It's all good. It happens a lot. It shouldn't happen heard, to and, me, though. We've known each other say, for years. Yeah, that's true. I know, but yeah, you actually say it to other people. Yeah, when I just don't want to deal with it and just yeah. need to leave my name somewhere. I told yeah. you, Dax doesn't bother mutilating his name. He just says his name is, is Jeff or Brad. Yeah. Like when he goes to uh, Starbucks, they're like, Max? No, Brad. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, rocking the panels over here in New York. We got Joe Hazen. How you doing? I'm doing great. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well. And on Vancouver Island, we got Quinn, 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 Quinn. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. You, uh, you, uh, doing some strong Q-Dragon work over there? Yeah, you know, do what I do. Yeah, nice. All right. Uh, and, uh, together again in Los Angeles, we have the, uh, West Coast Cooking Issues crew. We got Nastasia Lopez and Jackie Molecules. How you doing? Good, good. It's uh, storming here. Yeah, weird. Oh yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah. So now, uh, but you guys, uh, like, th- as long as you don't drown, you're pro storm because your reservoirs are filling. Like, what's the story? I think so. I think so. Yeah, but people are dying, so that's not good. Yeah. There's no wins. No winning. Right. Uh, <laughs> no winning. No winning. Uh, the, you know, the the new huge win is small losses. Small losses are the new huge win. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, in the in you know our New Year's way of doing this, uh, our we're gonna shoot the breeze with our special guest. Our special guest today is Rebecca Flint Marks, uh, the senior editor uh, at Eater Eater at Home Beat. How you doing? Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I found out. I just found out that we used to live before you moved to San Francisco. You came back here to mm-hmm. New York. What is it with San Francisco and New York, by the way? Oh man, <laughs> that's a great question. I think. For me, when I first started going to San Francisco as a New Yorker of about 10 years, I loved it because it seemed to have a lot of things that New York had. It had a lot of good food, really interesting people, people who read books, really pretty things to see, things to do. Uh, and I think it's, for me, it was like a more accessible New York, which was, it's a, that's a very uh, New York bias, obviously, to put on any place, uh, particularly San Francisco, because it is nothing like New York yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. So then, like, were you, because I'm not going to say, like, who in my family is like, well, maybe eventually you'll, maybe you'll figure it out if you know my family, but it, yeah, they moved to, New, to San Francisco and they're like, I can do this. I can do this. It's like, you know, and then they're like, no, nah, I can't do this. Yeah. It, it's weird. It was, I remember getting out there and I first lived in North Beach, which, If you're familiar with San Francisco, even if you're not, you probably know North Beach is like a really beautiful part of town. It is one of the most beautiful parts of town you can live in. It's like everywhere. You are just surrounded by beauty as soon as you leave your home. And I remember walking my dog around the neighborhood and thinking to myself, all this useless beauty, and I have no (laughs) idea what to do with it. And I I never felt more like a New Yorker than I did when I moved to San Francisco. And eventually, I think what bothered me the most, even though there was a lot I loved about the city, was there was, I miss the energy. And I realized how addicted I was to New York's energy. You just cannot get that out there. If you go out there expecting you're going to have even a modicum of that. Yeah. You, you won't, you, yeah, you're going to go crazy. Or so. if you even expect to have a 24-hour bodega. Yeah, that's the other thing. The streets are so empty. There's, like, nothing open past, like, 9 o'clock at night. The neighborhood I was living in after Noe, or after North Beach was Noe Valley, nothing. It was like a ghost town, and it was the eeriest thing in the world because I was like, I'm technically in the middle of a city, yeah. a real legitimate American city, yet there's nobody on the streets here. It was it was the strangest thing. I never could get used to it. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's yeah. bizarre. Uh, yeah. I get a feeling from what you said that uh, you and I share a trait that Nastasia uh, detests about me, and that is, uh, so Nastasia, when you say to me, when I, when you say to me, hey, I saw the most beautiful sunset, what do I say? I've seen every sunset. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares? I've seen it all. I've seen those yeah. sunsets. I've seen a sunset. So what? You know what I mean? Like, I'm that guy that went to the Grand Canyon, and I was like, hole in the ground, nice, <laughs> and, then le- and then left, you know what I mean? Yeah. Nastasia's like, you have no soul. Am I right, Nastasia? Is that roughly correct? That, yeah, that's true. But you do like trees. 
love trees because trees provide an ongoing yeah. they, an ongoing kind of calming effect on me. Like yeah. you know, like they change over time. I can like. I can observe them. They provide with me with shade because the sun's my enemy. I'm half a vampire. You know mm-hmm, what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, you know. Okay. You know. Steve, the sunset changes over time and provides you with shade because the sun is your enemy. The sun's going away. It should calm you. It's correct. You're correct. You're correct. <laughs> You're, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but Nastasi and I are like this in one way. I think maybe you'll agree uh, with this, uh, Rebecca, is that we hate it when other people do things because something else is beautiful because the weather is nice. Mm. So you mean like, for example? Well, so like when the first day, you know, the first couple of days of springy weather and I mean, now it's yeah. always like, it's always like half a spring here in New York yeah. because of the way things happening. But it's like, you know, when everyone started saying that they could do X, Y, and Z again because the weather was nice, Nastasia would Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She hates that. Yeah. Hear you. Yeah. Hear you. Yeah, it's like it's like mandated that you have to do it. So yeah. it kind of takes the fun out of just doing anything spontaneously. And I'm one of these people who if everyone else is doing it, I don't I don't want to do it. I'm very contrary in that way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. you know, the three of us can uh, go out. Uh, <laughs> we'll, maybe we'll go to uh, John's restaurant sometimes. It sounds like we could hang out and have a drink because we have <laughs> similar, uh, you know. We can be grumpy together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. If three grumpy people get together, right, at a bar, do we... Does, is it grumpy cubed or does it cancel? Is it like out of phase grumpiness? What do you think happens? Ooh, might just be a matter of like immediate self destruction. I don't know. Or it's like, I, I, I can't even imagine. Yeah, well, watch out, John. Or watch you get out. Seinfeld. I think maybe that's what happens. I don't think any of this. I think it's all past us getting that rich. You know, no one's going to get that Seinfeld money. Uh, all right. So, any of you guys have anything? Uh, any? This is the part of the show where we talk about food things that we've done Jack over the past says, week. Jack says. Jack says. Jack says. <laughs> Jack says. Jack does. Jack, Jack does. Oh yeah, yeah. What? Do uh, you want me to tell a story? All right. So it'll be quick. So uh, Peter Kim, who we all know, friend of the show, yeah. stayed at my apartment during the holidays in Los um, Angeles. In Los Angeles, right. while I was at Sean's apartment. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, Peter had a wild old time, and I got home, and there was a bottle of wine on my table, which is very nice, with a note. And I noticed as I looked at the wine, which I didn't recognize, that it was 5% ABV, which has oh really God. confused Nastasia. and Chateau I. Diane? He brought red, you a bottle of Chateau sweet, Diane? What? Red, red sweet wine, it says on it. It's oh, a weird name. Gina Casa Rosa. Gina of the Red House. Yeah. Yo. Five percent. But what else, Jack? What else? That apartment was a mess. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Jack. Did does does this five percent wine come with a baby bottle nipple on top of it? Like, what are you supposed to do with this thing? <laughs> he did leave children's jewelry on my desk. <laughs> oh, that's his. Come on, man. No, wow. no, no. We don't know. He went to a he went to a rave. And oh then, my god. Yeah. Yeah. He went to apparently went to a rave the night before and then had to rush out of the house. Hold a sec, hold a sec, hold a I would like the record to say that I love Peter Kim and I'm thrilled he had a good time in my house. Hold I'm on. not upset about any of this. Hold on, but. hold on, hold on. They still have raves? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. But, like, is it like, I'm trying to think, is it like uh, when you go to a rave and you're, and you're like a young person, let's say you're a young person, you go to a rave, is that the equivalent of like someone my generation going to see like a college presentation of Hair of the Musical? Like, I mean, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they're, 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 they're still getting weird. Okay. They're still getting weird. All right. Yeah. Just... And Peter Kim was there with them. <laughs> well, you know, I can picture that in a in a very yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, that's a good story. Not necessarily food related. I was hoping for a food related story. Wine. I guess the wine. It's wine related. Gina, Gina, <laughs> what is it? Gina Castle, Gina. Casa Rosso, not Castel Rosso. Yeah. She doesn't live in a Casa castle. Rosa. She lives in a red house, little red house by the lane, pumping out that five percent ABV. What do you think she dopes? <laughs> so she dopes it with with sugar and water. She no, takes a, it's got aromas and flavors of boysenberry, creme brulee, cherry soda float, and strawberry. A fun, flavor-packed ride with balanced sweetness, acidity, and varietal character. John, hold up. Hold up. John. <laughs> John. John, wait. John, wait. John. John, back back it up. That's one bottle has that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, can you please read that list again? Uh, aromas and flavors of boysenberry creme brulee, cherry soda float, and strawberry. Wait, wait, oh my God. wait. Hey, Nastasia, whenever we're in Los Angeles, where do we shop? <laughs> Ralph! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh my god. Oh my That's god. a terrible <laughs> oh description. We could try this really early here. Oh my god. You know what? You know what? It's like someone at a flavor house was like, we only have a little bit left of all these flavors. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> really Mix them all together. Dump them all together. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm trying to see if that's every description of it. Do you have it on you right now? Yeah. Open it. Oh, it's really early here. Oh, open <laughs> it for oh. the crew. Open it and taste oh, it. Oh, you stop here. What does it smell like? It smells really sweet. It sounds like it's what you would get like at IHOP with all when you mix all the syrups together. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh. There's some memories. Can you can, did you already un- uncrack it? Can you crack it on the mic so I can hear the cap? I want to hear the cap. That is the real description <laughs> they've put out there. It's in multiple places. You can't really hear it. There we go. We're going right, to right. pour a little bit. All right. Oh, it's kind of fizzy. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh my god. It's like it's like it's like Rioniti and filth. Surprised it's not sold oh. in that hazmat container. <laughs> it tastes like Make sure you let it breathe. Oh my god, it does. It tastes like complete sun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a good way? Wow. Um If you were eighteen warm, if you were if you were eighteen, would you get all crunked up on this or not? Probably probably, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, and go to a Maybe rave. Maybe got it at the rave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, okay, now that now that you've had a couple of seconds, how poisonous is the aftertaste? It's uh, sticky. Is, is the boysenberry <laughs> creme brulee notes coming through? Mm, mm, coming mm, through? Mm, so, like, when oh, I was I a, the soda float would be uh, on the, yeah. the tail end. It was the of cherry it here, soda yeah. float. Got it. Okay, I was uh, yeah. accurate. I was too old for uh, for loco, but. The four loco equivalent when I was trying to buy things like this was called Cisco. Mm. And Cisco was like a 20% ABV wine cooler. And that had some poisonous aftertaste mm. to it. So imagine, I'm trying to imagine if this, uh, if this uh, Gina of the Red House was 20 instead of five, like what it would taste like. Because that's what they would have been drinking when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 It's just so funny because there's so much wine at every single store here. Like, so much wine <laughs> that Peter would be like, you know, this one. Is he punking you? I don't think so. <laughs> it was wrapped in Christmas paper, Jackson. Like, wow. Was- <laughs> the Christmas paper costs more. First of all, here's the order of cost. The most expensive thing in that is the bottle that it went into because I know how much bottles cost, right? <laughs> then the wrapping paper. Then the liquid. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. That's uh, yeah. oh, well, you know what? Ding. That was awesome. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, now, uh, Rebecca, I know that your beat is uh, like things that people can do like at home, right? Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, one of it, your favorite things of the things that I've read of, uh, of yours on Eater is uh, to talk to restaurant folks either after they come out with uh, – chefs, yeah. after they come out with a book or after they – whatever, and get a recipe that is good for home with them, right? Yep. But I, I doubt that's going to happen with uh, Noma, and I know Quinn wants us to talk about the Noma clothing. <laughs> oh, thing. Noma. Noma oh, at home. Oh, Noma. Noma at home. <laughs> Yeah. Go, out, go outside oh my and God. forage for Make dog poop. Make a reindeer heart and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, find some lichen and you yeah, know, yeah, put yeah. it in a blender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got nothing smoothie. to say. Yeah, no yeah. smoothie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, have you been? I never. No. I haven't either. No. And no. obviously I'm never going to go. I was, you know, in the next two years you can't come. I'm sure like that went like this, all the I mean, that's the thing. It's, yeah, I think probably, yeah, within the first 15 seconds. The only time I ever had his food was, uh, you remember, um, Remember Corton? Sort of. Oh, uh, Paul, when Paul Lee yes, ran. Yes. It's Drew Nipront. Drew Nipront had, mm-hmm. uh, oh, I forgot, that was, that was where Chanterelle was, right? Yes. Yeah. So. so Chanterelle, and, right? And then that closed, mm-hmm. right? And then Corton with Paul Lee Brandt mm-hmm. uh, after he had left Gilt, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Where Gilt, the highest food costs, like, like crazy food costs. I was talking to Paul Lee Brandt. I don't know what he's doing these days. But anyway, I was talking to him. He was like, I'm not going to do his accent because I can't do, like, I can only, you know, Whatever, I'm not going to do his accent. <laughs> so, like, he used to order those, uh, you know those freaking Scottish prawns that come yeah. individually styro-packed in water? Right. Like, upright. And then, right. And he's like, yeah. And they're half dead, so, like, I was like, what the hell? He's like, I don't know, throw them away, family meal. I'm like, what? You know, oh his food God. costs were just like, wow! Yes. That's, wow. How is that sustainable? 
I guess it wasn't. It's not. <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah. No, but I think like there was an era and that's so well that's you know to the point of the Red Zeppi thing is mm-hmm. like that was a point in time when you know it was still like people were trying to do this kind of like ultimate ultimate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so <clears throat> anyway, so when he opened uh Corton, I think I went there twice. And one of the times, uh, Rene Redzepi was doing a pop-up at Corton. So I, that's mm-hmm. the only time I've had his uh, food. You know? How was it? It was good. Yeah? You know, it's good. I, like, I, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, uh, I, I like high, I like high-end food. I like seeing what people can do, but I don't necessarily, pay, everyone's going to hate me now. I don't, in, I don't enjoy it more than any other well-executed thing other yeah. than I like seeing what people can do. I like the craft of it. I like the artistry and the thought. I like seeing what the kind of apogee of like a certain kind of achievement can be, mm-hmm. but I don't necessarily crave it. I absolutely do not. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I sound like a Philistine probably because I am, but I just, I've never, I appreciate it from an artistic Standpoint. I remember interviewing Corey Lee at Bennu once, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, I never mean, went. I never went. I only went to interview him. I cannot speak to the food. I, I went to in situ. His other restaurant it was lovely, um, but I just remember thinking, like being in this sort of temple of a restaurant space, I felt very conscious of what I didn't know, but also what I didn't actually crave, if that makes right. any sense. Yeah. Like, I appreciate it. I really appreciate what people do. It is an art form, but I think for me, it's never been anything where I felt like I need to experience it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, also, like, uh, there's a certain there's a certain uh, aspect of anything that's kind of different, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, I remember, like, you know, in the early 2000s, kind of the shock of this new style of cooking, and you're like, wow, and it is awesome, like, mm-hmm. the first, like, couple of times, not, not, not you know, Red Zeppi's stuff, but I mean, like, what was going on in the early 2000s here in, in the U.S., right. like, you know, riding the kind of Spanish invasion that came in, mm-hmm. and it was truly exciting, and, like, the, the energy of cooking... Mm-hmm. And, like, learning these new techniques and doing all this stuff was awesome. And, you know, I was glad to be around the people that were doing it. And I loved going out and having it because it was fun and all that. But, again, you don't need to eat any sort of high-end food that often. It's, I think, better when you when it's spaced out. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I mean, look, when I lived in San Francisco, one of the best meals I ever had was at Meadowood. I was fortunate to be able to go there. I never got there. to go, yeah. It was really, really good. I mean, like, I so— I can appreciate that. Yeah. Like, like I was happy to have had that experience. Like, Chris Costa was lovely. The restaurant was lovely. Everything we ate was, like, a small miracle on a plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, like, did I want to eat like that the next night? Absolutely not. You know, like, I, I, I find that that kind of thing, it's, it's a little, like, fashion to me, you know, where it's, like, I love, like, the feel of, like, say, like, a designer coat that probably costs, like, $7,500, right? And I, I love knowing it's there. I love, like, experience it in some way. But am I going to go out and, like, try and emulate that on a daily basis and, you know, yeah, well, wear something like that? Probably not. Well, the problem is also for me, like... I would just wear it every day. It would become filthy and busted. <laughs> right. And then people would be like, why are you, what, what? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to yeah. buy a new thing every day. Like a $7,500 <laughs> dust rag, basically. Yeah. 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 Totally. So, no, it's like, I think there's a place for it. And it's interesting, you know, all these discussions people have been having around the closure of Noma. What does this mean for fine dining? I mean, there's always going to be a place for it. You're always going to have people who are going to, like, want to jet around the world and go to these restaurants that they can collect, like, runes, you know, and that's great. But... And, you know, and I think that kind of cooking should still be there because, again, like fashion, you see it trickle down, right, right. to where it influences a lot of different chefs at a lot of different levels. And so in some way, the wider populace, you know, gets to partake of that in some way, shape or form. Um, but, you know, when I read that Noma was closing, I didn't really have <laughs> any reaction to it. I mean, it's like it's like, yeah, it's the end of an era. For sure. But it's it's a really it's a complicated thing, you know, so I maybe if I had been there, maybe if I had felt a personal connection, I would have, I don't know, no. had a different reaction. I also but. never ate at El Bulli. I should have gone because yeah. of my job. The problem is, is that because Oof. of my job, I should have gone. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the issue. I'm that kind of a jerk, which mm-hmm. is what Nastasia always tells me. <laughs> Nastasia's like, you need to go out more. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I agree yeah, with Nastasio. Yeah, you work in food 
food, but you never ever uh, want to go geez, out. Louise, so never, I don't want to go out. Anastasia, do you know where he's of, still never been? Oh my god! Your restaurant, yeah, you know, it's it's really. <laughs> I have, I have it's been, sick. I have been, just it's not sick. when. Yeah, not, not when I was working there. But yeah. how many restaurants? Oh, whatever. We're, 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 I tried to go. <laughs> I know, <laughs> Dave. I'm just always going to give you a hard time about this until yeah. you come. You just need to accept it. Okay. You need to go to restaurants. I don't understand why you work in food if you don't go to restaurants okay. or bars. It's yeah, really you work, weird. You no, work, in, to, you work in food bars. and you don't even like food or food people. <laughs> I like, I love food. Uh-huh. I love food. Okay. I hate people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, Louise. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So, Quinn, is that enough talk? Is that enough Noma talk? Is that not what you were expecting us to say about it? I thought it was noteworthy to talk about. It is noteworthy, sure. You know, I mean, I I, I wish I could have gone. I would have liked to have gone. I would like to go to Denmark. Period. It would Uh, be nice to stop at Nomo while there. I was there for two hours. How was it? Yeah, uh, the train station, amazing. Not really. It was a train (laughs) station. Absolute flew us in to Copenhagen, and then we took a train to Skåne to you know visit where they grow the wheat and where they make the, the absolute, mm. and there endeth my Copenhagen story. Yeah. Right. That was it. That's a great story. Yeah, you like it? You like it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can say this, Danish sounds weird. Mm. It's, it's weird. It's like, it's like sounds like a cross between like an actual Scandinavian language and German. It's weird. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Closest I've ever gotten was Finland, which oh. I loved. Oh, yeah? Highly recommend I'd Finland. love to go. It's amazing. Yeah? Yeah. Helsinki, go in the summer. Uh, when it never gets dark, it is an astoundingly beautiful place, uh, especially if you're into Art Nouveau architecture or architecture in general yeah. and design uh, and food. The fish market there, it's just open air fish market. You go to, you buy this beautiful smoked fish and go eat it in a park. It's heaven. I it like is, smoked fish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like Finnish TV shows. I forget the name of it. I like to watch all these. You see that Finnish cop show? No. Yeah. No. Yeah, I forget the name of it. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. You know, when you watch something at like 1 or 2 a.m., it's like you're half asleep anyway, so you know you've watched it, but you can't remember anything about it. Does this happen to you? Yeah, that happened to me last night. I was trying to watch Tar. What was that about? It's Kate Blanchett's movie that came out earlier this year where she plays uh, the orchestra conductor. Oh, yeah. Who basically, yeah, it's, it's it's sort of her downfall. The movie is about that. Um, people love, love, love this movie. I was fortunate to get a screener of it and it took me three sittings to get through it because I kept falling asleep. Uh, but is that like because it was boring or because of just the time of day? Uh, a little, little bit, little yeah, bit. A little bit of both. Let's say it's a little bit of both. Yeah. yeah. She's great. She's great. Uh, she's all, yeah. yeah. She's, she's, seen great. Her, she's great. Yeah. yeah. She's great, she's great, great, great just, actor. Just, yeah. yeah. Just wasn't keeping me as awake as I needed. Yeah. Well, I also yeah. noticed, uh, that you, uh, you wrote, and I, I have to say, Maybe, Nastasia, when you were younger, did you watch movies? Do you stop watching them because you hate going to them and you don't like, like, cable? Did you used to watch movies or were you never a huge movie person? Nastasia. I guess they're on mute. But, you know, any modern movie, she's like, I don't watch that. Don't really? Know. No, yeah. Oh. No, no. I mean, I see, I'll, I'll go see pretty much anything. Yeah. Within reason. She doesn't yeah. like movie theaters. Oh, well, I'm, I agree with that. I used to love movie theaters. I used to, like, love going to the movies. Well, like, if, if she can unmute her mic or whatever, like... Uh, yes, I'm listening to oh, you. Yeah, We're well, well, I, I, you know, but so, like, what is it that you hate about movie theaters? It's not the COVID. What is it? The people's hands in bags of chips and the sound of them chewing things and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Any signs of humanity. So she actually prefers a COVID movie theater because there's fewer people doing that. No, or watching at home or a private screening room, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you also don't like the idea of paying some... You don't like the idea of streaming either very much. I I don't watch things because I don't like to feel things. (laughs) I did watch the menu, though. I was... uh, Austin came over to my house and we had dinner and he was like, you have to watch the menu. And oh my God, have you all seen it? No. It's crazy. No. Yeah. What's it about? What's it about? I'll let the guests explain it. (laughs) Well, I will (laughs) preface this by saying without Noma, we would not have had the menu because the menu is all about fine dining. It's about a chef played by Ray Fiennes who has a very exclusive restaurant on a small island and only a few guests at a time come to the island. So on this particular night, he has his guests come to the island 
and without wanting to give away any spoilers, basically serves them a meal they will never, ever forget. Mm. Uh, it is very, very, very funny. It's, you know, it's a dark satire. I'm guessing people get eaten. Uh, no, surprisingly, ah. surprisingly, but it is, you know, there is a certain level of bodily harm that uh-huh. is, that is exacted yeah. among. It's crazy, yeah. Dave, you have to see it. You oh. all have to see okay. it. It's really. great. Well, let me ask you this. So back when you were younger, Nastasia, did you ever watch the movie uh, Baby Boom? That was j- I just missed that. I was not watching rom coms when I was a junior in high school when that thing came out. So it's like it exa- like later in life, once I became a more integrated human being, I'm like the rom com has its place. You know what I mean? But like <clears throat> as a you know a full of angst, uh, you know, alternative music listening like suburban like white kid in the in the mid late 80s I wasn't watching rom not happening yeah yeah but so but do you watch that stuff is anyone here a baby boom a baby boom fam any not, fans? I watched it last I watched it last year I didn't watch it when it came all right, right. So you, so you and Rebecca need to talk. So, what's your premise with the baby boom? <laughs> I mean, what is it about? Or like, well, no, like, I... what, like what? You, you, oh, you're, yeah, you're saying it's like it's it was predictive of a larger trend. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, and I didn't even realize this because so I first saw Baby Boom when I was a kid, and so to me it was just this fun movie with Diane Keaton moving to Vermont. It was great. I loved it. I couldn't. I didn't really know why I loved it except that it was fun, and it was only as an adult after years and years of like covering the New York food scene and just the food scene in general that I went back and watched it. I was like, oh my God, this movie completely predicted like the aughts artisan food boom because the whole premise of Baby Boom is that Diane Keaton is this like high flying career lady who basically inherits a baby from a dead relative as you do. Like a literal baby. An actual living baby. Mm. Uh, And decides initially she's not going to keep it, then she decides she's going to keep it, and basically that interferes with her high-flying career as some sort of consultant. I'm not exactly sure what kind. But in any case, she ends up quitting her job. She's kind of forced out by the men there. She ends up leaving New York for Vermont, uh, buying this like 200-year-old farmhouse with these apple orchards, and starts making baby food, like applesauce, basically, and it turns into like this whole like company. So it's like she's marketing it as like this artisan applesauce baby food and people start buying it. It becomes this whole thing and there's like this rapid montage of like the business growing and growing and growing and eventually yeah, she's like the owner of this like artisan baby food company. And that's weird cuz that never would have yeah. happened in the 80s but totally could have happened in like 07. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. But so it was it was eerie like watching this. I was like, "Oh my god, this is like the artisan food boom playbook." Like, all that was missing was, like, a stall at, like, the New Amsterdam market or something. It was, or Smorgasburg. It was crazy. Yeah. 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 So it's, I I love this movie. It is a flawed movie. I'm not going to say it's a perfect movie. It's a Nancy Myers movie. Nancy Myers movies have certain issues uh, that attend them, but that's okay. It's, like, it's just a really fun movie. I love it. Well, and what, yeah. uh, what art form does not have its issues? I mean, this is, this is true. Yeah. This is true. I mean, especially anything that I watched when I was a kid. When you go back and watch it, you're like, oh, God. Oh, it's all. <laughs> oh, God. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, one of my favorite things to do is watch movies that I watched as a child and sort of pinpoint, oh, that, that's really a problem. <laughs> what percentage of the things, uh, we got to get back to food, but what percentage of the things you watch when you rewatch them, are you like, mm, flawed but still good? Oh, gosh, I would say probably 35 to 40%. Are still good? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, maybe I'm being generous, but that, that's the number that comes to mind. Yeah. 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 Yeah, okay. gotta. Yeah. You have to cut out the John Hughes movies. <laughs> like, that's the main thing. Just yeah, don't don't try and count the John Hughes movies. Yeah, I uh, I wonder, Stas, what about you? What do you think is a hold up number? Oh God, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm thankful when a movie still holds up at all. Like I like I was like, because you know, so when you have kids, right? You know, Joe, you're just gonna happen to you, right? You. You show your you, you go back and you watch these movies you love when you were a kid and you're like, oh, do I need to look at it first? Like, what's going to happen? Like, assume sexism and racism, like straight straight out the gate. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then you're like, is it still even going to be funny? You right. know what I mean? So like, you show the Blues Brothers too. You know, my kid, you know, my kid Dax, when I was like, oh, thank God, I mean, it's still funny. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the music is still great. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard. I just watched the Money Pit. Was it still good? Oh, wow. Still good. 
still good. <laughs> did, did it's you, still very funny. Did um, you get, I think Wendell Pierce had a cameo in that. Did oh, you yes, see that? Oh, yes. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That was great. Uh, yeah. What's the worst movie you've rewatched where you're like, oh, wow, stinker? Oh, boy. There's a lot of them, actually. I mean. One you legitimately liked when you were a kid. This happened to me with Space Jam. Like, that movie is really just, just a bad movie. <laughs> oh, God. Like, but, like, you legitimately thought it was good when you were a kid? Of course. It it's was great. Thing, is know? Space Jam yeah, the one with Bugs Bunny and the Martian and Michael Jordan? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, wow. Bad movie. Yeah. Oh, I, wow. And, and uh, was, it, was that an old Mel Blanc who couldn't do the voices anymore or his kid who can't do the voices? Oh, good question. I'm not even sure. I, Let's see. Nothing's uh, more sad than Mel Blanc not being able to do his own voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sad. Huh. Mm. Well, what movie does kind of like still hold up? And I was when you were talking about the the, the menu, and I haven't seen the menu yet. But the cook, the thief, his wife, her lover. Oh. I didn't like that when it came out because it was so I, gr- it's it so was boring so and gross to me. Gross and boring. <laughs> and then there's, there's that one scene where they're eating the body. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 but then yeah. you watch it oh, again. You're like, wow, this is a masterpiece. It's like a play on <laughs> film. Oh, yeah. So when I was yeah. like 19, when I saw it, you know, in an art house thing at college, it was already a couple years old. I'm like, let me guess. They're going to eat the J-Bar. Oh, they're eating the j It's boring. You know what I mean? I hated it. I, st- I like Tampopo, though. I'm sure that's still good. Yeah. Tampopo holds up. Oh, yeah. yeah that sure. movie's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, the worst movie that I liked as a kid, Crocodile Dundee. That <gasps> is... A dumpster fire from start to finish. That keeps showing up on HBO Max for some reason. Both of them. They should put it in HBO Min. To yeah, get rid yeah. Of that thing. It, no, it's crazy. HBO Max is like a treasure trove of now kind of dodgy movies. From but the also 80s. gems. Yes, yeah, so many, so like many. All good this movies. Criterion stuff keeps showing up on there. I'm like, what is this? Yeah, right. yeah. Food, food. Yes, food. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> so. Uh, one of, so w- one of the things that you seem, uh, what do you guys call it? First of all, people, people are going to want to know, mm-hmm. uh, moving from being a writer to an editor at like a huge place like Eater, what's that? Do you like that? What's the difference? Mm-hmm. Like, and if, if I'm pitching an article to you, how does that work? Like, what's the best way to pitch an article to you? Uh, just email me basically email me. So technically that is the way to pitch an article to me. Uh, the better way to pitch an article to me is to email me, but to also do your research before you pitch your article. So what does, so that, what does that mean? That means, so I mean, it's funny, I've talked to students, like journalism students, writing students about this before. And like, I think the biggest thing is like, why should I care about your story? Like why? Uh, is it timely? Does it tell me something I don't know or that, you know, I think probably a lot of readers don't know or don't understand? Uh, why are you the best person to write the story? Do you have some sort of experience with the topic you're pitching that would make me think, you know, you should write this? Also, is it a story or is it a subject that you're pitching me? Like, you know, there's so much that goes into it. A lot of people, you see this a lot with food. You see this a lot with food essays more than anything else. A lot of people pitch essays where it's like, you know, I learned to appreciate, say, porridge uh, because a family member died, and this got me through my family member's death. Are you making this up, or is this an actual pitch? Um, this is not an actual pitch. It is an amalgam of many, many, many pitches I've gotten. And I do not mean to diminish the people who are sending these pitches, because we all have a story, right? We, we all have a story we want to tell. You replace porridge with kanji, and people want to read it, though. That's true. It's true, though. And this is the thing, though. There's become a certain paint-by-numbers approach people take to food writing and food essays, where it's like... And again, I don't mean to sound glib here, but it's it, you notice certain patterns when you get a lot of these pitches. It's like people want to talk about things that have happened to them, whether they're good or they're bad, usually bad, actually. People are far more inclined to want to talk about the bad things that have happened to them, which I do understand uh, as a writer myself. Uh, this is how you work things out, right? But they want to talk about it through the prism of food. And it can be done well. You know, Obviously, we've seen plenty of examples of this being done really, really well. But a lot of it isn't really executed well. And a lot of it comes from not really a solid idea of, you know, how do you tell a certain story? It's a very, um, it's, it, I think it's one of these things that looks really easy when you read it on the page, because you're seeing this great finished product that's very cohesive. It's probably been edited a lot. The writer's probably also really good. A lot of people think it's easy to do. It is absolutely not easy to do. So like, 
or to do well. Um, so yeah, when, when people pitch me, I, I want to know like, why, why you, why this story? I mean, um, is the main problem with that whole kind of genre that it's very difficult to understand what's going to be interesting to people who don't know you or care about you? I mean, I do think when you are writing a personal essay, there is there is an onus on the writer to like make it universal, as they say. Like, like even even say like a terrible tragedy happened to you. This happened to you, but like why? This is gonna I'm gonna sound like a jerk when I say this, but like why should anyone else care? Like what what will readers like look at in this story and be able to take to their own lives, or how will it resonate to a wider audience? And I think that's the thing a lot of people don't understand is like. What separates what you're pitching me from something that belongs in a diary, mm. you know? And I think that's what a lot of people don't get past. But, yeah, I'm sure most of, I'm sure most of the stuff you get just kind of is not good. <laughs> but like, no, I mean, frankly, you know, it's, it's not where it needs to be. But is it, is, I, think, I feel like there's more of a place for that kind of writing to be great now than there was, let's say, uh, 30, 30 something years sure. ago. So like, you know, I think I forget which anniversary, but it's coming up because uh, a publicist sent me something, Nora Ephron's book. Oh, Heartburn. I'm, yeah. I'm going to be writing about that actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like that's, what is it? 30 coming 40. up? 40. All right. Wow. Jeez, Jeez Louise. I know. Yeah. I know. So, you know, the 40th anniversary coming out. And so like, uh, you know, whenever someone sends me something and I find it interesting, I poke around a little bit and I read all of, the, yeah, 83. I read all the reviews from 83 and I was like, wow. Like people are, even people who liked it, little little book, little this, little like always belittling yeah. yep. because it was something that was – and then I saw you know an interview she did <clears throat> like a year or two before she died talking about it. You know, basically, you know, basically saying, yeah, like they call it like a thinly disguised. Uh, did you read that interview she gave where I she's didn't, like, no. well, so she's like saying, yeah, they, they say thinly disguised uh, because I'm a, I'm a woman, basically. Yeah. And they're like, you yeah. know, it, it, it's a gendered thing. You know what yes, I mean? And much. so um, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. I think there's probably more space for people to be good at that now and not have the work be belittled. Do you agree with that or no? Abs absolutely. Yeah. No. And I think I think that's one of the things that's been great about how it's evolved is like we are seeing like more voices like we're, we're hearing from more people who you would not have heard from at all, like 40, 30, even like 10 years ago, you know, so that part, that's great. That part I'm absolutely in favor of. And, and I absolutely do think that food writing itself more generally has started to become taken far more seriously, you know, uh, in the last 10, 15 years. And, and, and I do think, you know, yes, a lot of the prejudices against it were because it was considered not serious. A lot of women wrote about food. You know, a lot of women ran food sections. Um, it was a domestic art. People didn't, didn't take it seriously. So you get somebody like Nora Ephron, who's writing about the dissolution of her marriage, you know, talking a lot about food. And it's seen as this like, I mean. Also just yeah. objectively funny person, good writer. So funny. Yeah, and yeah. like, yeah, yeah, like everyone should read this book. It's a great book, you know, and, and everyone honestly should be really impressed by somebody who can be that funny while writing about something that is really, really difficult. I mean, this is like a terrible time in her life her husband leaves her she's got two small children you know but she she makes it's she makes this great book out of it her, but, her famous husband oh my god Nastasia yeah. and I saw him at a party once I used to work with their son really <laughs> yeah. oh man Jacob yeah. yeah 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 no so I mean anyway yeah it's really easy for the or was really easy for people to belittle that kind of writing it still is I mean there's plenty of people who still belittle that kind of writing I think you also see that a lot applied now to food blogs you know you get that that sort of People love to complain about how you have to scroll and scroll and scroll to like a recipe on a food blog as if it's like some sort of like great burden. But like what they're really skipping over is like usually it's a woman who's like writing this food blog, writing, you know, about like what the recipe means to her, her family, et cetera, et cetera. And people, people just do not want to read it. They want to get straight to the food blog. So you still, or sorry, the recipe. So you still see that yeah. for sure. That's a weird one uh, because there's like, been a backlash to that and then a backlash to the backlash. Yes. So I don't know where that There's, I don't know where we are right now. We I think we're just in the middle of like infinite backlash cycles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, it, my point is that if someone's written a recipe that, you know, whatever, man, just like yeah. let them present it to you. Just scroll. Yeah. Just scroll. It's it's like you have a thumb most likely, so just like just scroll. It's yeah. really not not a great 
burden. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you and your trying to give me information. Yeah. Jerk. Like, how dare you try to make a living through your advertisements, which also depend on you, like, having a lot of content actually to give me. I have found that, and I'm 100% sure I'm guilty of this, but people who don't have to make something from nothing don't understand how hard yep. it is to make something from nothing. Oh, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's gimme, gimme, gimme. It sort of reminds me of, uh, I used to talk to chefs about this when, when, back when I was at the Village Voice, you know, we would do these, like the Village Voice had a big, like, I think it was, I forget the name of it, but basically we had a bunch of chefs come to the armory, serve a bunch of food to like a giant crowd. And that was like Taste of New York thing? Yeah, it was yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And, I remember talking to chefs, you know, who would be at these things and get so frustrated with like the people who show up because you get people who would just come and like take all the yeah. little plates and or like, you know, whatever was on the table, they thought they were entitled to like all of it. It was just this entitlement and this sort of like mindset of like, gimme, gimme, gimme. I don't care about what's gone into making yeah. it. Nastasi and I have worked plenty of those, right, Stas? Oh, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> and the thing is, is that like, what I don't like is, uh, uh, it's going to sound terrible, but when you're working one of those stations, right? Nastasia and I never did this. We put all of our energy into the product, and, like, we never fluffed out our table, mm-hmm. right? Everyone else, we'd look around, and we're like, oh, my God. We were in an event once, and jean George, literally jean George showed up in a sailor's outfit. It looked a lot like Joe Hazen <laughs> is looking today. Look, he showed up in a French <laughs> sailor's outfit. Ow. And... I'm going to buy you the hat, Joe. Anyway, like, uh, he had the hat, the whole thing, you know, the little free... And, and Nastasia and I were like, oh, we suck. We suck. Remember that, Stas? Anyway. Yeah, you went and bought like a lamb shirt. I don't. No, that, you don't told know. me to buy that shirt. Don't do that to me, Nastasia. Don't you do that to me, Nastasia. We go to thrift stores because yeah, Nastasia and I love thrift stores. And some person made for someone in her family like a denim shirt with a, like, a lamb on it made of lamb fur. Wow. Like a lamb shaped lamb made of lamb fur sewn on lamb wool sewed onto the denim shirt am i accurately portraying this nastasia yeah with a rainbow above it yeah 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 that's what made it the wow. rainbow and so i was like dave you're gonna buy that you're gonna wear it i'm like come on man and she's like you're gonna buy it you're gonna wear it and now all of a sudden i'm doing it now all of a sudden it's me yeah 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 but you wore that and why was why was john george in a sailor outfit but everyone at john george's booth was decked out like cosplay yeah, like cosplay. Yeah. <laughs> my Little Mutton. Anyway, my point is, is that, yeah, My Little Mutton. Oh, that's good. It's good. So uh, what, uh, what I hate is, like, the people who come to it, right? Mm. And they're, they're not really engaged. Like, their eyes are kind of at half-mast. They're, like, just, like, yeah. consuming everything. Yeah. They don't even look at you when they take it. Yeah. They don't care, really. They're human vacuums. It's just, like, it's not... Uh, and by the way, when chefs are doing that, they're not getting paid for that. No, no. no. One of the most interesting articles I ever wrote, I think it might have been for Time Out, I can't remember, but it was all about sort of the economics of those things and about how much chefs actually lose. Oh, so when, much. And like, what do you actually gain? Like, I think maybe a little publicity, but not really enough to justify. Right. And if you don't have enough money to pay the shift wage for the people who are working with you, yeah. they're getting hosed. Right. Right. Or, right. or you're getting hosed twice. Like, everyone's getting right. hosed. So... I know that you've paid a lot of money, people, to go to this event. I understand that. But what you got to understand is is that it's whoever you paid the money to that's running away with your money. It's not the cooks. It's not the bartenders. So please just look the person who's giving you the product in the eye and say thank you. (laughs) And if they want to tell you something about the food, listen. That's all. It's a very (laughs) – that's all you you need to do. You don't need to be like, I love it. But just – like, look them in the eye, right. accept the item. If, if it's on the table, say, may I take this? Mm-hmm. Some sort of, hi, you're a human. That's it. Yeah. It's all that's required. The you know? basic etiquette, human 101. People don't have it. No. When you're working a party, when you're working a party and people, like, yell a drink out, uh, order out of the side of their mouth at you and and don't look at you, Mm. and then reach over and grab the drink from you without looking, oh, my God, you're the guest I hate. (laughs) I hate that person so much. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I don't know what is it. Again, it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot. It's just dehumanizing. That's the thing. It's like you might as well be the vending machine handing them their drink. Right. And if I was getting 
paid at all, right? Or or paid a lot. I mean, because if you're paying, paying a lot, you're like, mm-hmm. I don't care. Yeah. You know? Treat me terribly. Punch me in the face. <laughs> like, I used to think a good business model, I, I had this thing where uh, when I was uh, younger, like uh, at the office, I used to work in an office, which is a terrible idea. When I graduated college, I was a paralegal. Worst job oh, in the wow. world for me, like soul crushing, except for my Xerox finger was very strong. I used to, I shouldn't say this, I used to go to the New York Public Library. Uh, New York Public Library used to have a very good circulating cookbook collection. Very good at the Mid Manhattan Library. Amazing, like stuff that you you know couldn't find anywhere. And I would uh, check it out on the way to work, and I would wait till everyone left the office, and then I would Xerox the whole book, bind it, <laughs> and then bring the book back to the NYPL. And that's so like my. And I used to do that also with the technical books at Sybil. This is how I like learned a lot of technical stuff before it was on the internet. Is I was copying all of the food tech books mm-hmm. at, at the at the um, science industry and business library in, in NYC. Shouldn't say this. Anyway, so uh, my Xerox finger, uh, uh, very, very strong. Very strong. Um, <clears throat> what were we talking? We're talking about things we hate, people we hate. I forget what I was talking about. That. Wow. I can't. <laughs> you were asking me about stories. Remember that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and then baby boom and I yeah. don't know. I don't yeah. know. Why was I talking about copying the books and why was I talking about the that job? I don't know. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I think we were sort of on the sort of track of dehumanization. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, this is the thing. It's like it's like. Um, oh, I know. So like my what I was gonna make a, a thing was I had this skill. That's what it was. Mm. Where you could no matter how big and beefy you were, and we had some big beefy folk in the office. Uh, you could hit me over the head with a copy paper box, empty, and, it w- and I was fine with it. No matter what you could do with a copy paper bo- box, like, I was fine with it. So I was going to stand outside of the—I of the, don't think I ever told you this, Nastasia. You know the information ball, the, the clock at Grand Central? So I was going to stand out there with—there was, was a guy— I used to work with who's never lost in arm wrestling. He doesn't look huge, but he's never lost in arm wrestling. And, you know, he comes from a long line of, like, uh, union bosses, right? Anyway, you get a kind of mental image of the guy, New York guy. And so he was going to stand next to me in case someone tried to actually punch me in the face. And then I was going to insult comic, like, just insult people as they came up to me. And then for, like, $5 a pop, they could hit me over the head with a box. Good business, right? Yeah. We couldn't get enough boxes. Oh, to make it work. You know what I mean? Because we were like, well, if we had like a hundred boxes, that's still only like 500 bucks. And then you can't <laughs> use the box twice. And where are we going to get all these box tops? But it would have been a good business, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you're making, you know, $500 an hour when you're 24, yeah, dehumanize me. Yeah. Why not? It's kind of goes not? with the territory, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, who, who, you know. Embrace the degradation. Right. Make a lot of money. If yes. you're going to be degraded, make a lot of money. <laughs> right? There you go. Yeah, there that's you go. Right. Brought it back, Joe. All right. Uh, hey, since uh, I don't know where we are in the show, John, you want to tell them about uh, Patreon, why they should join, what they get, what they don't, what they blah, blah, yeah, blah. Patreon.com slash cooking issues. You get early access to listening to the episodes and a call and link. You get your questions prioritized uh, when you send them in. You get discounts to all the awesome people we work with, like Kitchen Rats and Letters and whoever else we're partnering with at the time. Um, yeah, and you get to help support us, which is always a nice thing, too. So It'd be nice for us, anyway. Yeah, exactly. And we got great guests coming up. Quinn, who do we have on coming up next week? Uh, next week is uh, Caroline Schiff, executive pastry chef for Gage and Tolner. And then the week after that should be Chris Young to finally tackle the uh, infamous Creamy. Well, I mean, I'm sure he's going to want to talk about his new product that he's selling. And then we will yeah, also I'll talk about the yes. <laughs> I'm sure Chris is going to be like spending the entire time. I just came out with a new product. I spent years developing it. Let's talk about the creamy. <laughs> we, we will be making fun of the name creamy, though. It is a terrible, terrible name for a product, I think. Chris, yes. Yeah. Creamy. Hey, speaking of creamy. Uh, by the way, Patreon people. If there's something you want, let us know. John, am I right about this? Yeah, absolutely. We'd like to find better ways to engage with, uh, you know, the higher paying tier members. So let us know what kind of stuff you guys want from us and we will do our best to accommodate. Yeah. Like what I, what we don't have the time to do is to figure out what you want. But if there's something that you want and we have time to provide it, then why wouldn't we? Right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many people downloaded the 3D files that I put up there. Probably none. Or like the Pi books. Probably none. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I don't know. I downloaded them. 
Quinn, that doesn't count, man. You don't have to join. You work with us. You're you are. I'm saying I down I downloaded them before I started working. Oh, with them. all right, all right, fair. All right. Well, I appreciate that, Quinn. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, wait, something we were just talking about reminded me of oh, Patreon uh, listener wants to know. I forget who it was because I'm having trouble going Austin through. Austin Gibbs. Ah, yes. Wanted to ask you about editing the uh, the uh, Pakistani. Mango yeah. article and like what was going on with that and have you mm-hmm. now since you've done that ordered the do we miss the season already <laughs> is it already over oh yeah for now it is yeah yeah so that was a fun story um, so the writer Ahmed Ali Akbar he had actually already reported the story in another form for I believe it was I want to say it was either Cooks Illustrated podcast or Milk Street. Forgive me, I cannot remember that detail. Anyway, it had already come out sort of like in radio format. But he wanted to do more reporting on it, make it into a print piece. And so he brought it to us. This was right before the pandemic started. Uh, And so we were really enthusiastic about it. Uh, Again, we knew he'd he'd have to do some additional reporting for various reasons. Uh, But... You know, he was he was game, so we got started, then the pandemic happened. And we kind of had to put the kibosh on almost every long-form feature we'd been working on. Um, at the time, I was editing Eater's long-form stories. That was my brand new job right before the pandemic. And so, yeah, we kind of just had to sleep on it for, we weren't sure how long we were going to have to sleep on it for. We didn't want to. Well, why did mm-hmm. the long-form stuff get kibosh because of the pandemic? People, it well, seemed they have more time to read, not enough time to produce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would think so. Uh, no, well, a couple different things happened. One was like every editor who wasn't already sort of working on more breaking news was assigned to work on more breaking news and to pitch in there because obviously there was so much food news to keep reporting yeah. every single day of the pandemic. So well, it's all the same news. We're ruined. Yeah, basically it was it was like just an unending stream of depressing stories. <laughs> yeah. It was really terrible. But they needed everyone to pitch in. So so that happened. But then also they were like, well, you know, we've never done recipes. We don't really do home content, but everyone's now stuck at home. They're not really going to restaurants. So we should start doing home content, which birthed eater at home. So they then asked me, you know, would you this was now I'm this is like early 2021. They were like, would you like pitch in more? Like, we know you have like culinary background. I had been to culinary school, like I'd done cooking, blah, 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 blah. They're like, with your background, we think you should head this up. So I was like, fine. So that's how we started doing cooking content. So basically they killed they killed the entire long form program. Uh, and they were like, this is your new job now. So I was like, what about Pakistani mangoes? <laughs> and so I mean, that's what we want to read. Yeah, about. no, that's what's what I wanted to, to edit, you know. And so uh, fortunately, we were able to keep the story alive. It took like two pretty much two entire years. Um, but uh, yeah, Ahmed was great, you know, really like was a trooper. We finally got it done. Um and he published a story, and we were all, like, super excited about it, and we still are. And then it won a James Beard Award last year, which oh, was nice. awesome. I did get to try some Pakistani mangoes. And? They were delicious. I mean, Did you order from the WhatsApp from that guy? What's his name? Monat? What, what? <laughs> I forget his name. There, There's a couple of different guys, actually, you can order from. And now I'm not even sure, like, because I think there's been some shifts in the WhatsApp industry. I, do, I am not the person to speak about this, though. Right. Ahmed definitely is. Uh, he could tell you a lot more because— He's, yeah. When you had it, it, did you have it with him? Yeah, so I got them through him. He and, he was very generous in giving me some. And did he say, this is peak, this is what it's supposed to be? Because that's the thing I never mm. know. If you get something, like right. I ordered some Turkish cheese off Etsy the other day. Ooh. And I didn't know you could do that off of Etsy. I don't think you can, <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. But I ordered some Turkish cheese off Etsy because you can't buy Turkish. I mean, I'm sure you can, but like I, I live in New York. You'd think I could get... And there's a couple of Turkish cheeses that I really like. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah, so I ordered some off of Etsy. And they arrived in good condition. Like, they have very good string cheese. Mm. I know this doesn't sound like a lot, but the string cheese game. Have I said this on air before, John? I think so, yeah. The string cheese game, very, very good. Yes. And and they make a cheese called Tulum that's, like, aged in um, animal skin. Mm. Very good. Anyway, so, uh, yeah. I mean, was it peak? Did, did he the, say it this was? Is peak? It was ordered during peak season, so the season is relatively short. But did but he say that the one I gave to you? To be honest, to be entirely honest, I don't think he'd have a problem with me saying this because he was very open about it. He was not thrilled 
with them. He were like, with this could, batch. Yeah, with that particular batch. As somebody who had never tried a Pakistani mango before, though, I was not as critical <laughs> as right. he was. But that's why I think it's always important, and this people don't talk about this enough, it's always important to taste something like this. Like, if you're going to do any sort of holy grail situation, you need to taste it with someone who is experienced because yeah. then he can be like, these are good, but they're not the best. Yeah, that's what it was. He yeah. was like, "These, you know, the texture could be a little better, but, like, the flavor was fantastic yeah it was ambrosial it that, was yeah. that's what happens with my tomatoes like the tomatoes not my personal the tomatoes that i mm. am connected to mm-hmm. they're not the same every year no. not every year is the best you know what i mean so no. when i give them to people i'm like these are fine mm-hmm. this is yeah. a tomato yeah. still getting a, I mean, a nicely still, grown tomato uh, it's still better <laughs> than probably 99.9 of what you've ever had but yeah. it's not like it's not the one that was handed down from the mount. You know what I mean? Right, like Right, right. I mean that's the thing though, when you when you care enough about that and you have a hand in like somehow procuring these things, like it's never gonna be perfect, probably. Right. Not like it is to the outsider. But it feels so good when it is. When you can serve somebody something on your and you know that it's like that and then you're like because then if they don't like it, you're like, well, you're just a terrible person. <laughs> you're just worthless. Yeah. <laughs> I should not have wasted that tomato on you, no, you at did, all. You did not deserve it. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's when you go with your kids from being like, you should try this to crap. Get get out. You know, what I mean? <laughs> If you're not interested, I okay. disown you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a heartbreak. It's a heartbreak when kids don't like uh, well, whatever. Uh, all right. <clears throat> oh, did we finish talking about that? Uh I think I did, but if you have other questions, no, I'm happy to answer them. So, uh, Quinn, do we have any other questions from uh, Patreon and Discord on that? Uh, no, I had a lot of discussion about uh, <laughs> about the movie. The um, yeah, have that baby uh, boom. Baby a lot boom. of people, a lot of people, seen it. Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> all right, uh, all right. Now, here's the thing. Uh, so one of the things you do, I guess, as a bridge because, you know, you're now taking things that are like restaurant style at home mm-hmm. is you choose. And I don't know if we talked about this before the show or during the show. My mind is a blur when I'm doing these things. Mm-hmm. But uh, talking to uh, either like food personalities or chefs who have restaurants mm-hmm. who have done adaptations of their stuff for home. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the big things. Mm-hmm. But what's weird is that sometimes you're writing it with them. Sometimes you're writing it kind of as them. Mm-hmm. Like so, you, But it's kind of a fun fun thing. So how do you kind of choose like one and some of them. Let me, let me, uh, let me uh, make a little uh, beef, a uh, little beef with you here. Yeah. So... Uh, you did a uh, a thing which this recipe I don't know pheasant john sounds interesting mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. Uh, and so this is a, a a dish for the longest night of the year right right it's mm-hmm. nice to think of it as the longest night instead of the shortest day <laughs> right right so like glass half full yeah yeah, yeah glass yeah. half full kind of situation <laughs> so it's kind of um it's uh what is it it's, it's pomegranates walnuts and all yeah. this stuff yeah but then and so I'm assuming this is like. And I know they're tested because it says at the bottom of everything that you have a recipe tester. I forget her name. It's, Ivy. Yeah. Ivy was the one. Ivy Manning. Yeah. yeah. She's uh-huh. good at that? She's great. Yeah. yeah. We're very lucky to have Ivy. All right. So this instruction, a good trick. So you're cooking down, um, I guess, pomegranate juice and pomegranate molasses mm-hmm. in a thing. And then it says, a good trick to avoid scorching the bottom of the pot is to leave a flat bottom wooden spoon Resting right. in the pot so that the heat is conducted away from the bottom. But wood spoons don't conduct. What is that? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I mean... That was the case. That was the author of the recipe. That's her method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have not personally tried it. Ivy, Ivy said nothing about this to me actually in the in the testing process. Not to throw Ivy under the bus. I'm not throwing her under the bus, but it was not something that came up as like, you know, this is something that doesn't work or this is something that works really well. So we kept it in. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's fun. It's like so like so like uh, I don't know like when I read when I read recipes. I'm not reading them like mm, I would guess ninety percent of people read it. I'm just looking for weird things to pop out at me. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? me so, too. No, I, I'm <laughs> yeah, the same yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So here's another funny one from that same same recipe, and I know that like this is you know not not your recipe. It was funny. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, this uh, it calls for like pomegranate. Uh, I get, it calls for right pecmes, right? The pomegranate molasses. Yes, it yes. calls for pomegranate juice, uh-huh. and then John, you ready for this one? Half cup pomegranate. Arils, not use the technical term for what those pomegranate seed things are. Not like <laughs> pomegranate seeds. You're like a hundred percent of people <laughs> reading that are like pomegranate arils. What? 
But the same people are probably reading this online where they can then open a tab yeah, yeah, next yeah. to it. This is the thing about like, and I think this is also something that's changed, at least, you know, for Eater is like, I think like we like to assume a certain level of knowledge, right, yeah. among our readers. But the other thing is, is like, I think there's a lot less handholding in certain ways than there used to be with recipes, because I think it's like, it's either assumed that people have more knowledge now or that they have the ability to immediately gain that knowledge by doing a very quick Google search. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's do a, do another couple of these uh, of these uh, this, this style uh, of piece. Uh, have you, hey uh, um, Jack or Nastasia? Because uh, I think it's LA. Have you been to Pija Palace? Uh, either of you guys? I pronounce the name of that restaurant right? Yeah, I have. How, how I do, have. How do you like it? Describe it. The food was interesting. The room, I hated the room, which wow. I guess is not what you're asking, but it was like really fluorescent with a lot of TVs, and I, I, don't, I didn't bar. like being there. But the food was interesting. Yeah. So you want to describe what the what the kind of the what the food is, what it's what the style is. I guess it's uh, you know it's mostly pizzas, pastas, and sort of bar food with Indian flavors. Um, I guess that's that's about as simply as I can explain it. <laughs> right. So then this the mashup that you have on the on on Eater that you did um, with the chef is uh, uh, like a chicken kali merch. Oh no, it's pan- it's paneer. Paneer. No, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, kali merch paneer pasta. It sounds great. Yeah. It was it good? Did you try it? I actually didn't try it. That's the thing. I rarely get to try anything. Uh, but my tester loved it. Ivy loved it. They yeah. said it was great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And then. Uh, there's a couple more that you've done. Uh, cooking cookies for one. Okay. <laughs> and, yes. and Kimber's. This recipe is twisted. There's, it's flourless. Fine. Uh-huh. Okay, get this, people. It's. Uh, I like that it's in grams. I appreciate this. I do. 175 too. grams of light brown sugar, right? Vanilla extract, 225 grams of smooth peanut butter. All right, John, you ready for this? Ready. 100 grams of chocolate for dipping. It's not in the recipe. All of that is, it's cooked. It's not a Mm no-bake. All of it is bound by what, John? What are you binding this cookie with? Chia seeds? (laughs) One single egg. One single egg. One single egg. And they they hold together? Yeah. There's only six of them, though. That's the thing. It's like you got one egg for six cookies. All right. Yeah. It's it's not the feet. It seems like it could be. All right. All right, Ed with two Ds. Uh, You're also a huge fan of ruining cakes and then putting it over ice cream. I am. Yeah. I am. Yeah. I mean, because it's like you have... There's very few things that are going to ruin a cake to the point of inedibility. Like, unless you, like, put in salt for the sugar. Which you said or, you did. What I was had, that like? I did that, actually, in, in cooking school. Oh, uh, geez, Louise. Yeah, that was a that was a great day. It was, I, I d- couldn't tell you what it was like because I didn't actually taste it. I realized what happened, like, before it went to the oven. I was like, well, I guess that's not going to that. get eaten. <laughs> that's, that's going that. to the trash. Uh, yeah, so there's very few ways you can really ruin a cake to the extent you don't want to eat it. I mean, even... Even if you throw that cake in the trash, certain people will still pick cake out of the trash. That is the power of cake. Uh, I'm not saying I do that. Right. Two, and so two other things I've learned from reading a, a bunch of your articles. One, you have limited freezer space. I do. That's yeah. true. And mm-hmm. two, you like vegan A's. And so we have 15 seconds for you to talk about why <laughs> we should give vegan A's a shot. Oh, texturally, flavor-wise, it is great. It is not as unctuous as mayonnaise. It's a little lighter. It's just... Can uh, you cook flavor- with it like mayonnaise? Uh, I haven't tried. You mean like actually cooking, cooking? No, yeah, like, like grilled I make, cheese sandwich topping. Oh yeah, it, yeah, you can do that sort of thing. I yeah. make a lot of dressings with it though, yeah. and just put it on bread, and it's great. Yeah. All righty, Rebecca. Thanks for coming on. Come on thanks again anytime. Cooking issues.